So, Greg, let's get it kicked off, man. I'm really excited because this show so far, uh, Eddie uh, kind of stepped in, Eddie Wilson. Uh, he stepped in and uh, interviewed me a little bit about my background and uh, yeah. in and my as- aspirations to continue to invest in multifamily and where I think the market is and what I think new investors should be doing. And then, of course, what I've learned as the host of Think Realty Radio. Uh, let's kind of flip the uh, flip the script on you a little bit and uh, oh, cool. yeah, let's let's learn about Greg Rand in the early years. You were born. <laughs> I was born um, a long, long time ago. My earliest business memories were. Um, my, my mom was a real estate agent. Okay. And mm. so I remember my, my dad was a physician. So we had a dad as a doctor, mom's a real estate agent. And I took note early on that people, um, laid down and fawned all over doctors and they made fun of real estate agents. And that made me mad on behalf of my mom. When I saw the way they were depicted on television and the movies back then, I said, you know, I wonder what's going on. I have early, early memories of that. And I kind of made an informal study about essentially what the industry was doing wrong to create a perception where all these nice hardworking people that I knew and my mom was one of that I knew from her her business, which by the way, she became an agent, then a manager, then she started her own firm. Then that firm became a really strong firm. I took it over back in the late 90s and ran it up the flagpole. Um, so she had a great career. I got to witness entrepreneurship, but I had these early memories of people um, being frustrated with the industry. And so my first big play in the real estate business after school was um, right in the same timing as when the internet collided with with everything, but in the case of real estate. And I became very passionate about the fact that the reputation that the real estate industry has mm-hmm. that is generally sort of not super negative but not positive either, a lot of it emanated from the fact that you couldn't find out what was on the market without begging for it. This is back in the 18, 1980s, yep. 1980s, <clears throat> back in the 1980s into the 90s. And so I had a lot of passion for real estate technology mm-hmm. that was coupled with a passion for real estate as an investment, as an asset class. I knew that the two the two shortcomings of the industry I felt from early on was they're not open enough with the information, which has changed, and they don't know how to treat it as a financial vehicle. I didn't articulate it that way way back then, but I always thought that it was like this really phenomenal thing that wasn't treated that way. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a home, and it was pretty, and it was a nice place to live, but it wasn't a financial instrument. And so you fast forward um, you know, a couple of decades after that, and we formed this business as a, as a fusion of those two concepts, that real estate tech and real estate investment, this idea of real estate investment tech, and in the age of the cloud and mobile technology, and then the institutional investors that converged on residential real estate back about eight years ago, that created the, the window of opportunity to say, we're gonna turn residential real estate into an asset class now. It's always been out there. Small investors have been taking advantage of it. They've had no help from any professional industry. They've had almost no help from anything online. Um, They wind up linking up with each other, listening to other mentors, working with other people that share information because they didn't have any place to go to get the best tools, technology, data, and so forth. Um, And along the way, I was able to experience, because I had that mindset, I always gravitated towards people that were really creative investors. I was in New York, and so in New York, what you get a chance to see um, is neighborhoods being gentrified, waterfronts that were polluted being turned around and gentrified, uh, a lot of factories and warehouses and things that were not residential being converted to residential. This whole idea of highest and best use, find me a property that was used in a low use, a warehouse, that is also now dilapidated, so it's got poor condition, and it's in a tough neighborhood because that's what you get when you have industrial real estate. And now you've got three different things that can be spun positive. Um, and I saw that happen time and time and time again and just created this perception that real estate as an asset class is the most creative, the most hands-on, the most entrepreneurial playground out there if you're that kind of person. Um, and so I, you know, I've been diving headlong into it ever since. So I love real estate for many reasons, and I think one of the reasons that you just mentioned is because it is entrepreneurial. You have the business side, and you have the asset side, and it earns income. Like, it's incredible to me 
that more folks are just not in this asset class. You're, they're just not investing. Maybe it's because of fear. Maybe it's because they just don't know enough. But then I think that's where you have the role of mentors as well, right? Who are some of your mentors that really played uh, a dramatic impact in your upbringing in the real estate world outside of your mom? Um, well, thanks for mentioning my mom. Yeah, she was a she was a key mentor for sure. And the big story on that was being able to witness it from startup all the way through success mm-hmm. and the high fives and the tears and everything else. But a guy named Paul Adler, actually, uh, Paul, you could look up Paul Adler. He is a New York real estate icon, not the biggest guy in New York real estate from the standpoint of having made the most money, but the most creative guy, the most respected guy from the standpoint of his, his creativity. He's the one that showed me <clears throat> to, to ask the question. This is the question he used to ask. And he did it in his own head. And then I, when I started asking him to explain, like, how did you know? Like, how did you know that that waterfront factory that's dilapidated and, and polluted could actually be a film studio? <laughs> like, how did you how did you have the vision for that highest and best use? How did you know that was going to come to pass? Um, and he realized that what he asked himself very frequently was, what does that building want to be? Not what it should be. All right. What does it Mm. want to be? And I started seeing him attribute human traits to pieces of real estate. It was almost it wasn't it wasn't bizarre, but it was almost bizarre. It was he would refer to her or him (laughs) and it was a building. Wow. That's interesting. What does the building want to be? Yeah. And it was very personal for him. And he would literally you ever see those those um, those videos on, on the Internet these days where they find some poor dog that needs to get. Uh, cleaned up. They find a stray dog under a dumpster and they, they shampoo it and they show it love and they feed it. And then like the end of the video is this dog that was so down and out in the beginning of the video who's jumping around happy. That's kind of what I think of when I think of his pers- his his view, his point of view on buildings that were beat up. He felt bad for them. Hmm. And he could see <laughs> it's, it's, it led to such an incredible degree of patience and creativity and perseverance, like he was changing zoning, okay? Talk about perseverance. He was putting in the time to build the relationships to show people that we could clean up this environmentally compromised site and turn it into something that the public could use, right? Lowest use to highest use. Um, And it was because he had this sort of love, I guess is the right word, for these properties and sort of wanted to see them either be brought back to their heyday or in some cases being given a whole new lease on life, a whole new purpose in life. Um, and it was great. It was, it was, we talked about adaptive reuse. He was the adaptive reuse um, king in New York. And I just saw so many cool things that started with that question. What does that property want to be? That's a really interesting way to look at it. And I know the commercials you're talking about too. And I'm like crying at the end of these commercials, right? It's like, wow, what a powerful transformation uh, for this small puppy. And now it's like a happy dog and all of these things. And I can see that though, right? Because it gives you a different emotional tie-in and a different emotional connection to the property. A degree of commitment. Yeah. A deeper degree of commitment, a deeper degree of patience, a deeper degree of digging deep and not, and not giving up too easy. I mean, it, it ended up having, that's why when we talk about real estate ownership as a business, that we, we always want to hammer that point to your listeners that if you're going to build a real estate portfolio starting with one property, treat it like a business because so many of your decisions <clears throat> wind up falling into line correctly, mm-hmm. like having a long-term, long-term point of view being patient and waiting for the results, planning long-term for what the results you want to see are, doing the work on these things. It's kind of similar in that when you love the property and you can envision that property all cleaned up and and producing better income and being more valuable and having another century of life in front of it. That's right. when When he actually showed that he approached it like he was saving something or someone Uh, it ended up bringing a lot of really good momentum behind him. That's awesome. 15 seconds, not even. What are your plans in media in the next 24 months? Uh, Just to do more of this, man, to try to share the the news and help people break the seal and become investors for the first time.